This video includes two crime stories based on actual crimes committed and solved. If we can learn from these two stories, we will be educated instead of just entertained. I like the following quote from Bernard Malamud in The Natural, we have two lives. The life we learn with, and the life we live after that. I always say, ignorance is expensive. So I look for ways to learn about things that may affect me or my family. With this in mind, I edit and watch my videos as if I'm the victim. I watch and look for the warning signs that led up to the crime. Then I consider what I would do to prevent this type of crime from happening to me or to someone in my family. By staying informed and educated about actual life-ending crimes, I can move from being paranoid to being prepared. If you have not already, I recommend developing your own strategy to keep your family safe. Colorado Springs, Colorado, February 13, 2013. It was the day before Valentine's Day in the city of 400,000 at the foot of the rocky, spectacular Front Range. It's a beautiful area. It's not utopia, but it's always been very pleasant and very calm and very quiet. But at around 7 o'clock that Wednesday evening, Colorado Springs 911 received a worried call from one of the city's sprawling suburbs. Aren't that door is open and the front room is all messed up? The call came in as a burglary in progress. The caller was 33 year old Don Richburg. Do you think that someone broke into your house? It does not look like me. Even more worrying? Her stepfather, 47-year-old Miguel Mike Barajas, was supposed to be home. I'm yelling, Daddy, and I'm not getting no response. She says she saw a light on over by their mom and dad's bedroom. So she started walking towards there. And she stopped when she saw all of the bedding, sheets, everything pushed off onto the floor. For all the sheets to be pulled off the bed like that, that's not normal. She says she stopped, she got scared, and called us. While sheriff's deputies converged on the scene, the dispatcher ordered Dawn out of the house for her own safety. We're not sure if somebody's in the house or not. And when the deputies arrived a few minutes later, they rushed into the house, guns drawn. Anytime we're clearing a house, you know, we have our weapons out. What they found inside suggested a break-in. There was stuff thrown all over the place and gone through. But the ransacked rooms weren't all the officers found. One of the first things they noticed was the spray painting in the house. It looked to us like it was gang graffiti. And when they looked inside the master bedroom, they found it exactly as Dawn described. Blankets were all over the floor and everything looked in disarray. I yelled for Mr. Baraja and I didn't receive a response. I took a closer look and I saw a boot and a pant leg sticking out of the bedding. It was Mike, and he was dead. He was cold to the touch. He appeared to have been deceased for a while. And when Sandra Barajas, Mike's wife of almost 30 years, rushed to the scene moments later, the news would send the 52-year-old widow collapsing into tears. All I can tell you is that we have an unknown deceased victim in the house. Born in 1960, Sandra Siegel spent her early years in El Paso, Texas, where she grew up to be a brash and outspoken teen. She was very blunt, and she just said what came to her mind. Her direct nature and occasionally bitter tongue didn't deter the boys, though. Sandra dated steadily through high school, got married soon after graduation, and gave birth to her daughter Dawn in 1979. She was a happy-going girl. She liked to play. A few years later, Sandra gave birth to a second daughter, but her marriage ended in divorce soon after. He moved back with his family, and she kept the two girls. And by her mid-twenties, Sandra was still in El Paso, raising two children alone and barely making ends meet. She had a job at a local, like a convenience store, gas station. It was just a job to pay the bills, but it would end up changing the struggling single mom's life for the better, because that El Paso convenience store was where she met Mike Barajas. Born in 1965, Miguel Mike Barajas was the oldest of four brothers in a military family. We traveled 
all over. We moved a lot. Seems like every three years. And that just kind of brought us all close together. Being the oldest brother, he was left to babysit us a lot, so he never let us step out or, you know, get out of control. He was firm, but he was fair. He always watched out for us everywhere we went. After graduating high school in 1983, he followed in his father's footsteps and joined the Army. Once he graduated basic training, he was stationed out of Fort Bliss, Texas. It was while living off base at Fort Bliss that he first met Sandra. Every morning, he would stop at a gas station to fill up his car or to get a drink or something, and she worked there at the gas station, so that's kind of where they met. I guess he caught her eye, and she caught his, and they started talking and started going out dating. Obviously, one thing led to another. And roughly a year after Sandra and Mike met, they were married. We didn't make his actual wedding. All of us came down afterwards to visit him and meet her, and he was happy. I mean, he moved off post with her, and they got a they got an apartment at first. That wasn't the only big change for Mike either. At only 21, he was suddenly stepfather to Sandy's two girls, both under the age of six. He loved the girls. The girls loved him. He raised them. He gave them everything that they needed. And so that he could spend more time with his new family, Mike left the military in 1987 when his four-year enlistment was up and took a nine-to-five job as a security guard. He was always the breadwinner. Sandy had high jobs at different convenience stores and places like that. It wasn't enough for luxuries, but over the next 10 years, Sandra and Mike built a life together. He had a good life down there. He had everything he wanted. He had a wife, he had kids, he had good friends, he had, you know. The only thing he was missing was Colorado and his family. Because while Mike and Sandra were in El Paso, his brothers had all settled around Colorado Springs, where their father had spent many years while stationed at Fort Carson. Mike would bring him up to holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, every year. We'd go down at least once every couple of years to visit Mike and Sandy and the kids, just to go down, visit them, go over to Mexico, do some shopping, eating some food. But Mike had always longed to be reunited with his brothers. And in 1996, after more than a decade in El Paso, his brother Greg gave him the chance to do just that. I got him a job where we worked at the car dealership. I told him, if you want the job, they want you here Monday. Mike, who was used to sudden moves, didn't hesitate for a minute. Mike came up, and he left the girls down there so that they can pack up and get the house ready for sale. And then we all went down and got the girls and Sandy, and we moved them all up here. And when they came up, Mike was thrilled. Sandy wasn't so thrilled because she moved away from her mom and her sisters and the girls you know teenagers they were fumbling and grumbling because they wanted to go back home back to where they knew but after a few months sandra and the girls settled into life in colorado springs which thanks to the money mike was making at his new job was a step up from their old life in el paso mike was a very hard worker he went to work every day <laughs> Like clockwork, came home every day like clockwork. Everything seemed to be really good. You know, they seemed to be happy, just like any typical American family. Mike, happy to be reunited with his extended family, became very active in their church. Mike was real involved. He was an usher, so he, he did mass on Saturday night. Sunday mornings, they had breakfast after mass down at the Knights of Columbus Hall. He would go down there and meet the guys, and, you know, it was kind of his social hour. He would hang out, talk. And while Sandra often went to mass with her devout husband, she enjoyed more secular socializing. Sandy would go up to Cripple Creek, which is a gambling community. You go up there, it's like a little miniature Las Vegas. Their interests sometimes differed. But by 2013, after almost 30 years together, they still seemed devoted to one another. They would spend the evenings out on the porch. They were good. They were a happy couple. However, while Sandra's daughters were both grown by then, she and Mike weren't exactly empty nesters. 33-year-old Dawn, the oldest, was on the rebound, living at home after a series of failed relationships. Dawn was in another state for a while, but they would come back and live for a while. And Sandra's youngest daughter was living at home, too. 
I don't think out of the 15 years we lived across the street that there was more than a year when they had the house to themselves. Their mother and Mike were more than happy to help out, though. He was very, very generous to the girls. Everything was good. They seemed like they got along really well. <laughs> but the day before Valentine's Day, someone would break into the family's home and leave their happy life shattered. On the night of February 13th, 2013, sheriff's deputies responding to a reported break-in found Sandra Barajas' husband, Mike, dead in their Colorado Springs, Colorado home. He was shot more than one time with a handgun. The shooting appeared to be the result of a burglary gone bad. The window in the downstairs bathroom area appeared to have been broken from the outside in. Those weren't the only things that suggested a robbery, either. Colorado Springs was having a rash of home invasions and burglaries. And this time, the intruders may have left a calling card behind. There was suspicious graffiti and markings within the residence. The graffiti says something to the effect of, you got Jack Fool and WS-13. 13 usually, usually stands for a Hispanic gang. Hoping for a little more information, the investigators turned to the person who'd placed the 911 call, Mike's stepdaughter, Dawn Richburg. Dawn Richburg was the adult daughter of Sandra Barajas, who was living at the Barajas residence. The 33-year-old told the investigator that she and her mother had taken her younger sister to the hospital earlier that day, and that she'd returned home just minutes before dialing 911. Dawn was dropped off at the residence earlier in that evening by her mother. Once in there, she started saying, Daddy, 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 calling for her father to let her know, or let him know she was home. Um, she gets no answer, starts getting the feeling. She tells me that, uh, you know, something's not right. He usually always answers when we call his name. So she looks down the hallway to her parents' bedroom, and everything looked in disarray. That's when she gets nervous, calls 911, and backs out of the house until the police arrive. Dawn's story matched the account she'd given the 911 operator and the evidence at the scene, but there was something troubling about it. Her demeanor to me was very flat, non-emotional. It struck me as very odd how flat she was. Was Mike's stepdaughter, whom he'd raised since the age of six, simply in shock? For the moment, all the investigators knew for certain was that when Dawn's mother, 52-year-old Sandra Barajas, rushed to the scene after receiving notification of her husband's death, she completely broke down. Can I get a highly emotional and as far as outward appearances it, it, she appeared um what you expect somebody who had lost a uh, loved one unfortunately she had little to offer the investigators in the way of leads yeah, Nobody. Mike helped everybody. But when Greg Barajas and his brother Chris rushed to the scene after receiving word of Mike's death, they did have something for the investigators. Chris told them he'd called Mike at around 6 o'clock that evening, barely an hour before Dawn dialed 911. I called his house phone. He still had a house phone. And voice answered it. A voice that wasn't Mike's. Like, where's Mike at? And the guy that, on the other end of the phone, he says, oh, uh, he must be in the shower. And I said, well, just tell him his brother Chris called. Chris said he hadn't thought much of it at the time. I didn't ask who he was because Don had guys hang around the house. But the brothers said they'd become suspicious when they arrived at the scene and spotted a man they'd never seen before among the crowd of neighbors gawking from outside the police tape. He just stuck out like a sore thumb, you know, out there without a jacket. It's February, it's probably low 30, you know, 30 degrees. And uh, he 
just got cargo shorts on and a t-shirt. And then, moments before the brothers spoke to the investigators, the stranger had done something else that made them suspicious. That guy walks up and asks, will you give me a ride? I don't give you a ride where? I said, who are you? And he goes, well, I'm the girl's friend. Was he the same man Chris had spoken to on the phone? Neither of Mike's brothers knew for sure, but they thought the fact that the mystery man claimed to know Sandra's daughters could be significant. Detective Otto, he started asking me, he goes, did your brother, did he have any enemies? I said, the only enemies he has is his, his stepdaughter and her friends. According to what his brothers told the investigator, the trouble between Mike and Dawn had started when she was in her teens. She started having problems in school, and Dawn would get in trouble, and Mike would try to discipline her. But it had little to no impact. After Dawn barely graduated, she left home and spent the next decade drifting from place to place and from one bad decision to the next. She was always chasing after men and she started doing drugs. But a few months before her stepfather's murder, Dawn had ended up back home. She was living with a guy up on the north side of Springs and he died of a drug overdose. The brothers said that Mike had been willing to take his stepdaughter in at first. But as the weeks and then months went by and she showed no intention of moving out, the old tensions resurfaced. Mike was saying that he was getting frustrated. So I think it was starting to cause a lot of issues between the two of them. And now, since a strange man who claimed to be Dawn's friend had been hanging around the crime scene, the investigators couldn't help but wonder... Did the friction between Mike and his stepdaughter have something to do with his death? I felt that something wasn't right here. So that night, the investigators asked Dawn to come down to the sheriff's office for a formal statement without indicating that they considered her a person of interest. Dawn, I am sorry for your loss tonight. I know it's tough. Dawn replied by claiming to have a good relationship with her stepfather. We have good. I mean, we don't we don't talk every single day, you know, or not like hug them every single day, but we joke around a lot. It was precisely the opening the investigators had been waiting for. We have a little bit different story. But on the spot, Dawn insisted that her relationship with Mike had been good. He even tried to help me buy a car. So there, I didn't see it, no problems between us. However, she did admit to having problems with drugs. Have you ever been arrested before? Yes. Okay, for what? Um, but she insisted that she didn't know anything about her stepfather's murder. I don't have nothing to hide. I mean, I didn't do nothing. The investigators weren't sure they believed that. Her demeanor led the detectives to the belief that there was more information uh, that she knew. But they had to let her go. It wasn't enough to be able to charge anybody. However, they did give her a stern warning. I really hope you think that if, if you were involved in this, that you would be wise enough to tell me your story before somebody else did. And I can tell you this, in these cases, we will, we will solve it. It's just a matter of time. By Valentine's Day 2013, it had been less than 24 hours since Sandra Barajas' husband, Mike, was found murdered in the couple's Colorado Springs home. There was a great level of fear because our neighborhood is a very quiet neighborhood. We have a lot of retirees. We've never really had any issues in our neighborhood. And then for that to happen, is just quite a shock. We just didn't know what, how that had happened or who had done it or, or anything in it. There's a stark reality that it can happen anywhere. But while the family's neighbors remained in the dark, the investigators were beginning to suspect that Sandra's daughter, 33-year-old Dawn Richburg, knew more about the crime than she was telling the police. We've determined that Dawn had a substance abuse problem. Right away, I suspected the daughter's friends robbed the house and maybe it was... A robbery gone bad, Mike walked in on him. And then there was the mystery man Mike's brothers had spotted hanging around the house after the shooting. Was he 
he the killer? The police couldn't rule out the possibility. Investigators take intense interest in who this man might be. And since the mystery man had been asking for a ride, the investigators took a long shot. We contacted the local taxi cab company and tried to determine if there had been any pickups in the area on the night of the homicide. The result was an incredible break. There had been a request for a taxi cab to pick an individual up at a location that was basically just outside the police cordon around the residence. And if that wasn't lucky enough, when the investigators tracked down the cell phone used to call the cab, they came up with a name. 34-year-old Tommy Wright. Tommy was definitely an individual that was someone the police wanted to talk to. And while investigators set out to find him, they brought in Sandra to see if Tommy had any connection to her husband. Have you ever heard the name, Tommy? I heard the name. Mentioned by your owners? I heard the name, but I don't know who he is. Though Sandra said she thought Tommy had been to the Barajas house. He's only come over the house once since it was in December. Yeah, I mean, unless he's been there, you know, when we weren't there, but I only remember him coming over, like, one time. The info made Tommy the top suspect in Mike's murder, but it took almost a week until February 20th for the investigators to track down Tommy Wright. We were contacted by the Springfield Police Department in the very southeast corner of the state of Colorado. They just picked up Tommy for an unrelated crime. Tommy Wright was arrested on car theft charges, aggravated motor vehicle theft charges. As soon as they got word that he was in custody, the Colorado Springs detectives made the three-hour drive to Springfield. But they didn't find Tommy in a cooperative mood. They didn't want to talk to us when he was arrested in Springfield. Would they even need him to talk, though? After their trip to Springfield, the investigators returned to Colorado Springs and got a warrant to search Tommy's car and the apartment where he'd been staying. Sergeant Otto, during his search of the vehicle and the apartment, recovered a 45 caliber handgun. The gun was sent to the crime lab to determine if it was the murder weapon. They compare the bullets that were recovered from Mike's body to the firearm. But if the bullets matched, would it be case closed? Or would a shocking new development take the investigation in a surprising direction? By May 17, 2013, it had been three months since her husband's murder, and Sandra Barajas and her daughters were struggling to move on without Mike. She said that they were hoping to move to another state where there was some family and some support, and that they were just hoping to start over. And it seemed that Sandra might soon have some official closure, too, once the ballistics came back on the gun found in Tommy Wright's car. We did have the murder weapon. And on May 17th, during the grand jury hearing to formally indict Tommy Wright for Mike's murder, the authorities received an unexpected break. Sitting next to DA Reggie Short, getting a text message from one of my cohorts saying that Tommy Wright is willing to tell everything. Hoping for a confession, the prosecutors arranged to put the grand jury hearing on hold while the investigators once again sat down with Tommy. He completely acknowledged that he had been the one who fired the fatal shot. He took two steps forward to the bed. That's when I stood up and shot him. But just when the investigators figured they had everything they needed to convict Tommy of murder, his confession took an unexpected turn. Tommy reveals that this wasn't a break-in after all. It was a murder plot. And the real shock was who Tommy claimed was behind it. He had done it in concert with, or specifically at the request, of Sandra Barajas. Tommy's claim caught the investigators completely by surprise. Quite frankly, Sandra Barajas was not a person of interest. And over the course of several opportunities to speak with her, she certainly appeared to be distraught over the loss of her husband. But according to Tommy, it was all an act. Tommy told the investigators that he'd met Sandra through her daughters. Tommy told me that he met Dawn and her sister 
at a local convenience store in Colorado Springs. They met, started talking, some flirting. He goes with Don, her sister, to the residence. He spends some time there. They party, do drugs, things like that. And according to Tommy, once Don brought him home, Sandy had approached him with an offer. Sandy tells Tommy Wright she wants her husband dead. They're supposed to give me the truck. Um, they offered me, they offered me five grand cash. However, according to Tommy, it wasn't just the five thousand dollars Sandy offered that sealed the deal. It was something else. Sandra had told Tommy that Mike had been behaving inappropriately with Don's sister in a sexual manner. This infuriated Tommy, and he felt he was going to step up and do the right thing if he would kill Mike Barajas. Tommy told me that they talked about the plan to kill Mike, and they agreed. They came up with a plan, down to details. They're going to stage a burglary. They're going to use spray paint to write messages on the wall and suggest that it's gang members who broke into the house. Tommy said that once the plans were set, Sandra and Dawn took Dawn's sister to the hospital so that Sandra would have an alibi. They left the residence, leaving Tommy right behind. I started painting right as they were leaving. And then, after taking the 45 from Mike's gun cabinet, Tommy had laid an ambush. He describes positioning himself inside the bedroom with the lights turned off. And at around 6 o'clock, Mike came into the house. He described the moment that Mike walked into his bedroom. Tommy said he was crouched at Mike's bed, holding a 45 caliber pistol. After Mikel is dead, what all do you do? Um, I just pick up the showcase first. But then, while waiting for Sandra to pick him up when she dropped off Dawn to find her stepfather's body, the plan had gone awry. The phone rang, and he answered the phone thinking it was them, and it was actually Chris. That phone call screwed my heart. Hold on, hold on. Because according to Tommy, after he hung up on Mike's brother, he panicked and fled the house. He hides in a drainage ditch, and at some point, he doubles back and returns to the house. He asks several people for a ride, and when he can't get one, he uses a cell phone to call a cab company. The things that Tommy was telling me fit and were consistent with what we had found. But would it be enough to pin the murder on Sandra and her daughter? I proposed to Tommy that he place a phone call to Sandra to talk about what happened with Mike. Minutes later, with the detectives listening in, Tommy made the call. But it was Sandra's daughter who answered. Hey, Don. Yeah. What's that? was Tommy. It's clear from the first words of that phone call that Don is A, not thrilled to hear from Tommy, and B, very concerned that this person would be reaching out to her. But Tommy pushed on, regardless. Let me talk to your mom, because she kind of she kinda owes me big time. She has a hold of me big time. Dawn didn't deny it. And when she put her mother on the phone, Tommy quickly got her to admit even more. I told you I'd take his ass out, and I did, did I not? And if I'm saying that, that would be stupid of me to say if somebody was. I do have to give Tommy credit. He was very savvy on the phone. I, I kept my word, and I killed Mike for you, did I not? Yeah. Okay, so here's what I need from you. He needs his money. Money that, as it turned out, Sandra didn't have. How much money will you be able to give me? Um, I can give you five hundred dollars. It was only a tenth of what he'd been promised, but the fact that Sandra agreed to pay Tommy anything was enough for the investigators. Sandra agrees to meet Tommy at the Walmart location on the north end of town. When we have obviously units waiting for her. As soon as she got into the area, she was stopped, contacted, and subsequently arrested. And soon after Sandra's arrest, deputies went to her house and took her daughter Dawn into custody too. When we heard about the arrest, we were surprised that 
in some ways it was a relief to know that it wasn't some random attack. On February 4th, 2014, Sandra Barajas went on trial for murder in the El Paso County Courthouse in Colorado Springs. The 53-year-old was accused of orchestrating the murder of her husband, Mike, who died in February of 2013, the victim of what initially appeared to be a home invasion robbery. There was quite a bit of evidence that supported that idea. But when the investigators caught up with Mike's killer, a petty thief named Tommy Wright, he told them that the so-called home invasion was just a cover for a murder plot cooked up by Sandra and her daughter. 34-year-old Don Richburg. Tommy, Don, and Sandra were all arrested for Mike's murder. But why would Sandra and her daughter want Mike dead? It certainly wasn't the reason they gave Tommy when they recruited him as Mike's killer. We never found one piece of evidence, one statement that substantiated the claim that Mike had sexually abused Don's sister. Instead, in his opening statement, the prosecutor claimed that Sandra's motive was far simpler. She had a gambling problem. According to the prosecutors and Mike's brothers, Sandra's gambling trips to Cripple Creek had crippled the family's finances. You go up there and you can lose all your money in hours. That was a family in severe financial distress. And it appeared to be a condition that was getting worse at every opportunity. The family was having difficulty making their bills. He was starting to have problems with making the mortgage payment every month. But he was telling us, my house is in foreclosure. And the prosecutors theorized that by the beginning of 2013, things had gotten so bad that Mike finally decided to do something about it. I believe he finally told her that he wanted a divorce. And since Sandra didn't have a full-time job, the prosecution argued that Mike's decision had created a new crisis for Sandra and Dawn. Sandy doesn't work. You can count on one hand how many times she's ever had a job in the whole time they were married. They couldn't survive without Mike. At least not if he divorced Sandra. But if Mike died? They knew Mike had life insurance. It wasn't really a whole lot. I, I think all of a sudden done, it was 150000 but according to the prosecution, that $150,000 was more than enough. Anytime that you've got family and financial distress, that's always a motivation. Sandra wanted to pay off the bills, to, to pay off the house, to pay off whatever bills she had and then have money extra. And that wasn't the only way that Sandra could cash in on her husband's death either. They had an accidental death that they had through his work and then his retirement. He was worth more to them dead than he was alive. They figured they could live the rest of their life off of what they got off of him. According to the prosecution, it was easy to convince Sandra's drug-addicted daughter to go along with the plan. This was a murder plot that was hashed out while Don and Tommy Wright were using methamphetamine. And they claimed that Sandra's offer of $5,000 just as easily convinced Tommy to be the trigger man. Paying someone to kill someone that you married and was the love of your life at one time is just unimaginable. It might have seemed unimaginable to most people, but the prosecutors had a powerful witness prepared to testify that it was true. The district attorney's office had come to um, an agreement with Tommy Wright. It was either nail him to the wall, because they definitely had the evidence, and send him to prison for life, and let Cindy possibly walk, or make a deal with him and get Sandy. We felt we had to make a deal with the devil. And when he took the stand, Tommy did his best to look the part. Tommy was entirely nonchalant about the description of killing somebody. He had like a smirk on his face, like he enjoyed it. And as he testified, the entire courtroom hung on his every word. It was absolutely riveting to hear. Or infuriating, depending on one's perspective. I wanted to get up there and go beat him to a pulp is what I wanted to do. Tommy had such an arrogance about himself. In fact, Tommy's arrogance was so off-putting that the prosecutors worried that his testimony could backfire. We were concerned it wouldn't be enough to get a first-degree murder conviction. 
Luckily, they had the tapes to back up Tommy's story. I, I kept my word and I killed Mike for you, did I not? We felt it was beyond a reasonable doubt that she should be convicted of first-degree murder. However, despite the phone calls and the fact that she'd been arrested while trying to pay her husband's killer, the defense argued that Sandra was innocent. She has steadfastly maintained that she was not responsible for Tommy Wright killing her husband. She was somewhat in disbelief, almost like we were making these things up. However, there were at least some parts of Tommy's testimony that the defense agreed with. The suggestion from Sandra Barajas is that it was Tommy Wright and Don Richburg who were responsible for the murder. And according to the defense, Sandra wasn't involved at all. It was her daughter, Dawn, who'd recruited Tommy alone. Sandy and her defense team basically turned the whole thing over against Dawn. She had a problem with drugs, would do anything to get him, saw her stepfather, Mike, as someone who was in the way of her getting what she wanted. And according to the defense, she didn't hesitate to get rid of her stepfather, the man that had raised her from the time she was six years old. They described her as a con artist, um, backstabber, um, very mean, hateful person. She would do anything to get to what she needs. She was very uh, manipulative. She was a liar. My belief is she is a cold-blooded person, too. Very, very capable of murder. But if that were true, why was Sandra the one who'd been arrested paying for the hit? According to the defense, it was only because Dawn had pressured her mother into it. They said Dawn was so manipulative, Dawn was so demanding, Dawn so mean, I'm terrified for my life. It's all we heard for a week and a half was Dawn, Dawn, Dawn. On Friday, February 21st, 2014, the jury announced a verdict in the murder trial of Sandra Barajas. The 53-year-old mother of two was charged with orchestrating the murder of her husband, Mike. She's the one who, who lack of a better word, was the brains of the operation. She was in it up to her eyeballs. This was Sandra actively participating, actively seeking out someone to carry this out. And the man who'd carried it out, 35-year-old Tommy Wright, had been the star witness for the prosecution. Tommy testified, and it was tough. I mean, because you had to sit there and listen to all the gruesome details. But would those gruesome details be enough for a conviction? Or would his conduct on the witness stand sway the jury in Sandra's favor? He, at various points, seemed to break out into either a smirk or some sort of laughter. She thought that she would, she would get off, that she would find not guilty. Tommy would not be credible. And when the jury finally filed back into the courtroom, Sandra may have had reason to feel confident. The deliberation went two and a half days, which started to worry me because I've, I've always heard the longer the jury deliberates, typically it doesn't go in the prosecution's favor. But would that be true this time? Sandra was found guilty of first degree murder. She was very, very surprised when she was convicted. That shocked her. Mike's brothers were just as overcome. They're all very happy, broke down, started crying. She was going to jail for life. In Colorado, the sentence for first degree murder is life without parole. Sandra's conviction was enough to convince her daughter, Dawn Richburg, to cut a deal. The 34-year-old had also been charged with her stepfather's murder. Dawn pled to secondary murder. She had just seen her mother be sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. I think that anybody would have to think twice about whether they wanted to go through that same process with that same potential outcome. Since the trial, Mike's younger brothers still struggled to deal with their loss. I lay awake night thinking my brother died senselessly. He was a good father, husband, just all the way around a good man. But they take comfort in knowing that Sandra will ultimately pay the price for what she's done. It's a peaceful thought to think she's going to take her last breath behind those walls.
It's October 28, 2007. Bolingbrook, Illinois. A small suburb about 30 miles outside of Chicago. Safe place to live. Everybody knows each other. Neighbors watch out for each other. I'm Steph Watts, and I reported on the Stacey Peterson disappearance. The local police get a call from a Cassandra Kales. She reports her sister Stacy Peterson missing. What makes this call unusual is the person missing, Stacy Peterson, is married to Bolingbrook Police Sergeant True Peterson. Stacy's sister Cassandra gives police an account of the last time she saw Stacy. Saturday night, the night before, Stacy disappeared. I went over for dinner at Stacy's house. I'm Cassandra Kales, Stacy Peterson's sister. When I was leaving, she just said, you know, if anything were to happen to her, Drew did it. I gave her a hug, and I told her everything would be okay. And that was the last time I saw her. The next morning, Stacy fails to show up to meet Cassandra at her friend's house. Something they called Stacy. If I call, she usually answers. And Stacy's phone was either on and ringing or it was off. It was kind of doing that all day. So I called Drew. He just answers the phone and starts running his mouth. Your sister left me. She took the car. She took everything and she's gone. She left. Why would a seemingly happily married mother of four just pick up and leave her entire family behind? Drew called Paul to tell him, hey, Stacy's missing. She took money. She took her bikinis and she took off. I'm Norma Peterson. I'm married to Drew's brother, Paul. I'm Stacy Peterson's sister-in-law. I didn't believe anything. I knew she would never leave her kids. For Stacy, family was everything. As Sunday wears on, Cassandra's concerns turn into desperation. By this time, it's like 1 o'clock in the morning. And I went to a bowling brook police department. Finally, I get somebody, and they're like, oh, are you going to come back? And I said, no, you don't understand. And I started talking, and finally somebody came, brought me in the back. I told him everything, and he said that they would look into it. Stacy was 16. She was working at the hotel when she met Drew. It was a, a secret in the beginning. It was, I gotta go meet Drew, and she would ditch me. This man was so much older than her. She said he was the father she never had. I'm Candace Aiken, and I'm Stacy Peterson's aunt. He took her a lot of places. He bought her a lot of jewelry. I think Drew basically charmed her. She felt safe. She felt secure. Yeah, the badge. It could protect her. It just gave him more power to make her fall for him. I think Stacy was brainwashed by Drew. Stacy loved family. She had adopted Drew's two children, and she had had two children with Drew. That was Stacy's whole world, was taking care of those children. She didn't leave her children willingly. It's Monday, October 29th, 2007. Day one of the investigation of Stacy Peterson's disappearance. My deputy chief walked into my office and said, uh, Ray, um, Stacy Peterson is, is missing. And I didn't connect the dots right away because I was like, who, 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 who? And he says, Drew's wife. My name is Ray McGurry. I'm the former uh, police chief for the village of Bolingbrook. Well, right away, I'm like, okay, well, what are the issues here? What do you mean she's disappeared? information was coming back to me that Drew had said that she had met somebody else. She didn't want to be a mother anymore. And it just ran away and was going to be off the grid. I said, okay, maybe that very well is true. I, I mean, I don't know what I don't know yet. We, we were initially doing some quick background investigation. Uh, we were working the neighborhood, working the neighbors, trying to get some background information. Okay, so when was the last time you talked to Stacy? Our mindset was that right now, we don't have a homicide. We have a missing persons, and, you know, and if we find her, well, then this is all of the point. Okay, if she's alive and well, no harm, no foul. The first person police usually look at in a missing persons case is the spouse. But this time, the spouse happens to be one of their own, who claims his wife left for another man. Drew liked the whole 
profile of being a cop. He liked being able to tell the stories about it. He liked to be able to discuss the things that he had done that day. Drew Peterson's badge gave him credibility and authority, and it really defined who he was. It was a big part of his life. However, rumors swirled of abuse of his badge. There was perhaps two sides to Drew Peterson. It was too early in the investigation to form 100% opinion. This is the guy to focus everything on that. I mean, you, you have to go go into these things with an open mind. Because he's a cop, I believe they were protecting their own kind, the blue wall, or the badge, or whatever you want to call it. Cassandra is growing desperate. I went home, and I was like, what do I do, what do I do? Cassandra, I talked to her, and she was telling me that she had went to the police. She didn't know who to trust on the force. She really did not know where to turn. I didn't know what I was doing. I just Googled, called the news station. <laughs> we called CBS, and he's like, they're coming over. I said, okay, when? Right now. My main goal right now is to bring her home. And then after that, it was boom. <laughs> My phone was blown up. Everybody wanted to talk. Instantly, news reports on Stacy Peterson's disappearance covered the airwaves. Cassandra lit this thing quick. Within 24 hours, there was every national network, every local network, and they were in the lobby with the camera crew and wanted a statement from me immediately. Stacy was reported missing, but I wanted to consult with the family. They have my guarantee of 100% cooperation. I hardly ever watch the news, but when you're living it, you have to. And I was proud because I was the one that went to the media. Who else would have brought her on all the attention? There's no signs of any foul play, so that's why we're handling it as a missing persons investigation. In the media, we're getting two different stories. We've got Stacy's family saying, She's missing. We don't know where she is. And we've got her husband, Bowling Book Police Officer Drew Peterson, saying, She ran away. She left me. What we had to figure out is which one of those two stories was the correct story. I knew right away in my heart that Stacy was gone. I knew. I knew it in my gut that Drew had done something awful to Stacy. She was gone, and I would never see her again. So I get a call from my dad that uh, Stacy left him. She took some money and the titles to the house and left. I didn't think it was unusual that she would have left because, well, she was 30 years younger. I'm Steve Peterson, and I'm Drew Peterson's son. Growing up, I was definitely close to my father. He was always there for us. He was a great father. We never went without you know, you, you, you told something, and my dad says she left. There's no, you know, reason not to believe your dad. So you question it. Early on, Drew was fairly welcoming. I remember we walked in the front door. He comes down the stairs and has a pill bottle in his hands, puts it on the desk, slides it across, and says, look at me. I'm 30 years older than her. She was young. She was beautiful. She was taking medication. He was hinting that she was troubled and perhaps on drugs. He said it in a way that he was almost embarrassed that we were there. An older guy and his gorgeous young wife had left and he didn't really warrant all this attention. I absolutely believed his story. While Drew Pearson is busy charming the media, Stacy's family and friends seem convinced of something far darker. Just remember seeing her on the news. And thinking, oh my God, this is not going to end well. She just said, you know, if anything happens to me, Drew, Drew did it. We left Drew Peterson's house and walked next door to neighbor Sharon Bukowski's house. Lots of people in there, concerned neighbors, concerned friends, members of the media. And what I found out was interesting and also alarming. Stacy Peterson wasn't Drew Peterson's only wife. As a matter of fact, she was his fourth wife. Third wife, Kathleen Savio, had died accidentally in the bathtub. As soon as Stacy went missing, somebody mentioned, well, you know, his third wife died under unusual circumstances. So I asked for the file. His third wife is gone, and now his fourth wife is missing. You can't tell me that you don't think something's going on here. 
October 30th, 2007, 23-year-old Stacy Peterson is gone. Her husband, Bolingbroke Police Sergeant Drew Peterson, says that Stacy left him for another man. But Stacy's sister, Cassandra Kales, refuses to believe Stacy abandoned her family. My gut told me that something happened to my sister. <laughs> the reaction that Cassandra gave me, she was absolutely convinced that she was going to turn up dead. He asked Cassandra if she thinks her sister is still alive. Cassandra absolutely hated everything about the Bolingbroke Police Department. As the person that was married to her sister, who was a sergeant, I was his boss. In her mind, Cassandra made a snap judgment that A, she was murdered, and B, that Drew did it. Drew killed Stacy. He's guilty. He's come forward and tell the truth. Tell me what you did to my sister. By day three of the investigation, assisted by the media attention that Cassandra had created, community volunteers join in the search for Stacy. Friends, family, and strangers took the search for Stacy Peterson into their own hands this morning. But Stacy's husband, Drew, is not part of any search. Have you had ever taken part in the search for Stacy? Well, there's two things. One thing, it's like I'm such a media sensation right now. If I go out and search, I think the search would be hampered by. Number one, all the media attention I'd be getting. And two, why would I look for somebody who I don't believe is missing? She's just gone. She's just where she wants to. Whatever your dad tells you is the truth. You know, okay, she'll be back. Let's wait it out. And I'll see what happens. People at Bolingbroke were phenomenal. I mean, just phenomenal. They just came out in droves wanting to help. We we'll go and be there to support them at the church, the command center, and then go out and set off the search. At the time, searches were being launched from the church that I worked at. It was kind of a control and command station. I'm Neil Shorey. I'm the pastor of Naperville Christian Church. I was Stacy and Drew Peterson's pastor. We'd have search leaders, and we'd go to various places throughout Bolingbroke to search. It felt purposeful, but it also felt incredibly stressful. This is a missing woman, and it's our job to find her. While the search continues, the state's attorney works a different lead, one that will yield disturbing results. As soon as Stacy went missing, somebody mentioned, well, you know, his a third wife, Kathleen Savio, died under unusual circumstances. She drowned in the bathtub, but she was never in any amount of water in that bathtub. So I asked for the file. I'm Jim Glasgow, state attorney in Will County, Illinois. When Stacy Peterson goes missing, James Glasgow requests a re-examination of the death and autopsy of Kathleen Savio, Drew Peterson's third wife. I had a meeting with the coroner and Dr. Mitchell, who had done the autopsy. We went through all the, the different facts. When I saw the photograph of her in the bathtub, I immediately knew this this wasn't an accident. There was no blood above her body. She supposedly smashed her head against the wall, knocking herself off so she drowned, and there's no blood above her body. This is the problem. Is it possible that there was a cover-up in the investigation of Kathleen Savio's death? When I looked at the autopsy report, it rocked me out of my chair. It, it made me look at this in, in a whole different light. You didn't have to be somebody with 25 years police experience to understand that this was by no means, from what was written in this report, an accident. The media and law enforcement, we believe that it was very possible that Kathleen Savio was murdered, that it was not an accident. We felt there was definitely cause to do the second autopsy. And there hadn't been an exhumation in a criminal case in Will County for 40 years. Up until now. Drew Peterson has not been a suspect in the disappearance of his wife, Stacy. But with this new discovery, he is someone the eyes of the law cannot look past. Now, we have two separate cases that were running across each other. My office is working with the police in their investigation into the disappearance of Stacy. And at the same time, we're looking at the questionable death of his prior wife, Kathleen Savio. So, you're dealing with a policeman and potentially two murdered wives. In speaking with Kathleen Savio's family members, everyone said Kathleen Savio was potentially Drew Peterson's first victim. Journalists and law enforcement start looking for possible clues by taking a deep dive into Drew's past.
grew up in suburban Chicago. He went to Willowbrook High School. Drew served in the Army. He was a military policeman. I'm Joe Hosey. I'm a reporter. I covered the Drew Peterson case. He married his high school sweetheart, Carol Brown. Drew and Carol had two children, Steve and Eric. After he got out of the Army, he and his wife and children lived in Bolingbrook where he was a police officer. He joined the Bolingbrook Police in 1977. Two years later, he was named Police Officer of the Year. Growing up, we got to ride along with my dad. Or he'd let us run radar, decide whether I'm on tickets or not. You know, fun stuff that any kid would love to do. The only time you have a police officer father, you know, he's a hero. You know, he's everything. When I spoke with Carol, she said their marriage was an average, normal marriage. That Drew was a great father. There was never any acts of violence, according to Carol. Carol, my mom, she's never once told me that he's ever laid a hand on her or anything like that. Are Drew and Carol really so happily married? Or is there more to what meets the eye? He quickly moved into the narcotics division, headlining the, the war on drugs in, in that area. Drew was part of a special multi-jurisdictional undercover narcotics team. He grew his hair long, he had a facial hair to build with the part. He loved talking about how he could fool people into thinking he was a drug dealer or a drug buyer. He had to be a really good liar for people to believe who he was. I'm sure it, I'm sure it affected him. Being an undercover police officer, you can do all of the things the criminal does, but you know that you don't have to pay the price. I'm Dr. Jeff Gardier. I'm a clinical psychologist. Most law enforcement understand the roles and can go back to regular existence, but there is a minority of individuals who lose themselves in that role. Is it possible that Drew is taking advantage of his position of power? For him, it's more of a thrill. Look, I get to go be undercover and go hang out with all these bad guys, and they look at me like I'm one of them. And I have a girlfriend over here that I have to keep up with. And then he would leave that life to come home to Carol. Drew was able to live two lives simultaneously. You know, the old joke they said was they'd have to lie to their girlfriends to get home to their wives. You know, he was good at it. After 10 years of marriage, Carol realizes Drew is no longer the man she married and wants a divorce. His infidelity. That's what causes his first divorce. Drew found someone else. I met Drew. I was working part-time at a gas station, and somebody had run off without paying for gas, so we called the police, and he was the officer that showed up. I'm Kyle Morrison, and I was engaged to Drew Peterson. I was very young. I was 20 years old. He was 27. Divorced, had two small children. My family really liked him. He was a really nice guy, very charming. And he was a police officer in Bolingbrook. We were engaged probably within four months. Kyle is impressed with the successful cop and father. But the relationship isn't working out for her, and she decides to call it quits. It was suffocating and stifling. He didn't like me going out with my friends. Everything was a, a fight. When I broke up with him, Drew was heartbroken. He called my mother at work, and he was devastated. And at this time, he had already started a relationship with someone else. It's really crazy. He continued to harass me afterwards. I was going to work one day. Drew pulls up in a squad car with a woman officer. He gets out, and he's smiling, and it's all funny, and he says, you're under arrest. And I said, for what? He said, because you have all these unpaid parking tickets. So literally, put me in the police car. I was really scared and frightened. And the woman was in there, and I said, well, you know, I was engaged to him. And she was like, oh, no, I didn't know that. And you could tell, once she knew who I was, that this was inappropriate, I found out later he had been writing tickets for my car that I never got. So I did call the police. Unfortunately, because it was Bolingbrook, one of his friends came and said, well, you know, he's just upset. You don't really want to press charges. They ended up just dropping the whole thing. I think that is probably what makes this story scarier. 
It's not just the average guy. It's a cop. You're supposed to be able to trust them. After his marriage to Carol and his failed engagement to Kyle, Drew marries Vicki Connolly in 1982. Vicki was very nice, easy person to get along with. She thought, here's this wonderful guy, he's going to take care of me, he's going to take care of my kid. Drew got married a second time to Vicki Connolly, who he owned a bar with. During the time he was married to Vicki, it was actually a good family time. I don't think there was anything we didn't celebrate. You know, Vicki was great to us. Drew got with Vicky quickly after his relationship ended. They both had children from separate marriages, and he continued his work as a police officer. His warnings to me about working undercover were that you would have to have a whole different life. So much stories my dad would tell me. He mentioned people pulling guns and putting them in his face and pulling the trigger, and it gets jammed, and how he should be dead, and this distress of it all, I think, just weighed on him. A darker side to Drew Peterson started to unravel during his marriage to Vicky. It's rumored that there was some illegal activity happening with Drew. I know one person he arrested telling me he shook him down. Drew wanted him to provide cocaine that Drew could turn around and sell. Drew was never charged with that. And no one can say if there's any truth to it. But there was a pattern emerging of Drew allegedly abusing his authority, trying to intimidate them with his uniform and his badge. He actually got fired from the police department. He was charged with a felony for official misconduct. He was conducting unauthorized investigations, investigating drug dealers without the knowledge of his supervisors. Who knows what he was really up to? It took Drew and Vicky a couple of years and a lot of money to get that all straightened out but at a later period of time they reinstated him i believe they even apologized to him for putting him through that despite enduring this turbulent controversy together drew and vicky's decade of marriage becomes troubled by something even more upsetting vicky told me that she knew drew was being unfaithful to her and that she basically just wanted to get out of the marriage during the divorce, she told of Drew trying to hold on to all of his assets. He didn't want to give up anything. When he talks to his family to tell them he was breaking up with Vicky, oh, well, she's a drug addict. She's spending too much time at the bar. It was always making that other person look like it was all their fault that he had to make the decisions that Drew felt he needed to make. One night, Drew arrives at the bar. He tells Vicky, why don't you take the night off? Vicky says, sure. She's driving home. Brakes fail. She can't stop the car. Vicky's car is driven off the road. And the mechanic said, somebody cut your brake lines. She couldn't prove Drew Peterson did it, but couldn't think of anyone else who would have done that. They didn't break, they were caught. Vicky told me that she believed that Drew Peterson was the one who cut her brakes in an attempt to stop her from getting her pension and getting at any of the bar money. So she backed off on the pension and then everything went smoothly on their divorce. A few weeks later, Vicky wakes up in the middle of the night and Drew Peterson standing over top of her in the dark, staring at her as she's sleeping. He didn't say anything, and he just left. What did he tell her? I own you anytime I want. Drew made it known to Vicky that there wasn't anywhere that she could go that he wasn't going to find her. This is obviously a person who carries a chip on his shoulder. Now we're getting a developing picture of someone who has troubling relationships, someone who wants the world to kneel before them. Drew would reel these women in with the promises and with the honeymoon stage. Now that honeymoon stage was over, now it's time to go on to someone else. Kathleen was about to be 30 years old, and she wanted to settle down and wanted to have children. So her friend, she said to him, why don't we go on a blind date? And that's when she met Drew. I'm Sue Savio Doman. 
I'm Kathleen Sandra's sister. She said he was very nice, very smart, he had a lot of money. She liked him. She did fit the profile that he normally went after. Someone who was younger that he could prey on. Someone who would look at him like a rescuer. She said, he wants to marry me. It seems strange to me that she would get married that fast. They were married fairly quick. We just lost our, our stepmother, Vicki. You know, now we're moving on to a new one. She's moving in within a couple months, and it, was, it seemed a lot pretty quick to us. And we just kind of had to deal with it. Her first trial, everything was fine, and then after the second one, Drew would disappear a lot. Sometimes I'd even come home. With all my heart. Drew got me first. Three years, it seems like thirty. We knew that they were arguing. We didn't realize the extent of the, the fighting that was going on between those two. One night, Kathy came home from the bar. She left early. My dad lost his mind. He did destroy the house. Glasses were shattered. The tables were flipped. It sounded like a train was coming through the house. There were issues with Kathleen Savio's that come to find out at the house where we were showing up several different times for different arguments. She was being painted as being nuts. Drew painted that picture. Drew working for the Bolingbrook Police Department could influence the outcome of whatever that call may be. Well, he's he's a sergeant with us. We know him. That's how that picture got painted. Well, that's wrong. Bolingbrook police were called to the Peterson home a shocking total of 18 times during Drew and Kathleen's marriage. Things really broke down with Drew and Kathleen when she received an anonymous letter from the police department. Their marriage fell apart. The letter said that Drew Peterson was having an affair with a 16-year-old, Stacy Kales. <sighs> Kathleen was in shock. She couldn't believe it. She didn't understand why he would go with someone so young, a child. Should have been charged with a sex crime because he's a police officer and a person in a position of authority, and she's 16, and that's against the law in Illinois. Drew was on the phone trying to convince me everything's fine. He said somebody was lying at the department, and they sent her this phony letter. She grabbed the phone, and she said, I have it here, and you're not getting it. I heard the phone fall. Then she said, he's hitting me, he's hitting me. He threw her against the refrigerator. I could hear her. And I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God. She got away. She went right to get an order of protection. Kathleen said the letter was true. Drew was having a, an affair. She was done with him. I don't know how he got away with his relationship with Stacy Kells. He wasn't keeping it a secret. He brought her out with him to police officers, social events. People in the town government were aware of it. No one told him to stop it, and no one charged him with a crime. Right when Stacy turned 17, she's got a house, so we bought a house. I believe he was trying to buy her love. Drew came to Kathleen and said, how about we divorce and we just settle later on because Stacy's pregnant. Kathy initially contacted me because she was divorcing Drew Peterson. I'm Harry Smith. I was Kathleen Savio's attorney. As an attorney listening to divorce clients, there is the stories that are pretty standard. Hers was not. She had accusations, concerns, fears that were far outside the norm of what you would hear from a divorce client. Stacy would come to court with him. It was incendiary. I mean, it was crazy. What that added to the dynamic in the hallway between Kathy, Drew, and now Stacy being there as well. Stacy told me that he was leaving Kathleen because she's crazy and abusive. I didn't know what to say, but that's what Drew was feeding her. Stacy said that Kathleen wanted all of Drew's money and Drew was scared about his retirement. Kathleen was pretty much like a nuisance in their lives. Kathy was so convinced of the evilness that was her husband that it was hard to fathom. It's what made
makes this whole case so strange. She was telling the truth, and it was impossible to accept. October 10th, 2003. Kathleen and Drew divorce, but they leave financial details to be resolved later. It was a bifurcated divorce, which is extremely unusual. And they did it so that Drew could go ahead and marry his teenage girlfriend, Stacy, while the financials, which is what most divorce disagreements are predicated on, was still hanging out there. It wasn't a big wedding. It was just this spot Stacy picked out on this beautiful little place in Bolingbrook. Once again, despite getting exactly what he asked for, Drew Peterson goes on the attack immediately after his marriage to Stacy, eight days after he and Kathleen divorce. Drew got Kathleen's garage opened, and he cut a hole going into the living room, and he crawled through there. She was coming down the stairs with her laundry basket. She got scared. He told her to sit down, and he put a knife at her throat and leaned her back. He was going to be telling her how it was going to be, and he said, I can kill you now. But if I killed you, there'd be too much blood. Then they would know it was me. Now he's got this really beautiful woman. He says that he has moved on, but yet he has to be in control. He can't seem to get over anything that he views as some sort of a slight. Divorce clients don't break into homes dressed in black clothes and hold K-bar knives to women's throats. It all doesn't feel possible. She took me to the state's attorney's office to tell them that he was going to kill her. She wanted people to know that he broke into her house and had threatened her with a knife if she didn't come into compliance in the divorce. It sure felt like it couldn't be possible. He's just not going to kill somebody. There's a divorce pending and he's a police officer. But just days before the divorce trial to settle the financials begins, Harry Smith receives a shocking call. We had a trial date set. My secretary called me and said that Kathleen was dead. After Drew Peterson's fourth wife, Stacy, disappears in 2007, the state's attorney, Jim Glasgow, decides to look more closely at the earlier accidental death of Drew's third wife, Kathleen. As soon as Stacy went missing, that same day, somebody mentioned, well, you know, his third wife died under unusual circumstances. So I asked for the file. What he finds upon re-examination rocks the case wide open. All I can tell you is that if any experienced prosecutor looked at that file, they'd say, this is not an accident. Jim Glasgow looks deeper into the night Kathleen's body was found. Monday, March 1st, 2004. Drew arrived at Kathleen's to drop the kids off, but no one answered. He returned the following night to try again. Drew said that he went to the house and he didn't answer. This is maybe about the second or third time he tried to get, you know, knock on the door. So he went to the neighbor's house. He asked the neighbor, do you think that you can go in the house and see? Because I can't go in there. If I go in there, Kathleen's going to call the police on me again. Now here you've got a situation where any trained cop knows... Holy cow, she could be in there, she could be dying, she could have died. All kinds of situations requiring professional assistance. Does he call the fire department? Does he call for police backup? No. Those would be the things that an innocent man would have done. Drew called a locksmith and they went in the house. He stood outside on the bottom of the stairs. He let everybody go scattering. And the neighbor just was going upstairs and found her in the bathtub in a fetal position. The neighbor screamed. Drew knows exactly where to run when he goes in the house, runs right upstairs, and then goes in the bathroom. He took her pulse. He said she's dead. He's now putting his DNA in there, his fingerprints and his hair, in case that happens to show up. Now he's got an explanation for it. He's a 30-year policeman and trained in every aspect of policing. He's the watch commander, the safety guy for the whole town. Drew called the police. That was it. They just said, okay, no, it looks like an accident to me. No investigation, no fingerprints, no questions, no nothing. 
investigation at the beginning, uh, they, they dismissed it as an accident within a half hour of arriving at the scene. They didn't collect any evidence of any kind, no searching for DNA, fingerprints, fibers, hair. Um, thankfully, there were pictures taken that were helpful to us. I don't know how we got away with it. I think it was sheer incompetence. You know, how could the police have ignored this? Glasgow finds, incredibly, that when Stacy is asked by police to give an alibi for Drew, she is not alone. Subsequently, they had an interview with the police where he was allowed to sit next to Stacy basically like a ventriloquist with his hand on her back, uh, coaching her as she gave the story that he wanted her to give. He was always manipulating other people. And not only did they allow Drew to sit next to her, they did that questioning in the basement of Drew Peterson's house. They didn't bring them to a police station, which is ridiculous. The other issue was is that, you know, that many people in the Bollywood Police Department may have known what Drew was up to. I absolutely 100% reject that. There may have been one or two officers that were friends of his off-duty. I have no proof that they ever helped him do anything that involved Kathleen. You look out for each other. You know, police officers, you, you look out for your, your fellow police officers. And, you know, you're like your family. The day Kathleen died, Stacy called me. At least three times that day, crying and hysterical. Stacy was very freaked out about Kathleen. She just kept calling me. They found her in a dry bathtub. That seemed kind of sketchy to us. But what are you going to say? I got a call from my dad. You know, Kathy died. You need to come home. And, you know, hit you like a ton of bricks. You just couldn't believe it. It was a total shock, and, but, okay, okay, accidents happen. The coroner's inquest, whoever was directly involved, which they all knew Drew, so they were the ones that established what had happened, and it was an accident. We went to uh, an inquest. I went on the stand and told them that Kathleen was murdered by Drew Peterson. She documented everything that was going on in that marriage, the abuse. And they came back and said it was an accident. The family had to accept that it was, but we never believed it. We knew that Drew was controlling the police department, and we couldn't do anything. We had to follow protocol. How did Kathleen Savio die days before she was heading to divorce court no one listens to the family that's saying we've got documented reports of abuse we've got kathleen savio saying if anything happens to me it was my ex-husband with suspicion swirling kathleen is buried quickly and drew brings a shocking end to his divorce settlement her dying didn't end the divorce the judge has jurisdiction on behalf of her estate to see what her estate is going to get from Drew Peterson. We never got there. Drew came to the probate court with a will that he said he had found where Kathleen Savio allegedly made his uncle the executor of her estate. He fired me and they then closed the divorce on behalf of the estate. It was laughable, but there's a lot of things that happened in this case that were like that. Everybody told him that, wow, that was you know, quite, the, quite the break. He got real lucky that he don't kind of, you know, pay that this kind of worked out for him. Kathleen, she's buried. The story's buried. Law enforcement had have done their job if people had paid attention to what happened to Kathleen Savio. Stacy Peterson wouldn't be missing. Drew was always playing by his own rules. But you go under the assumption that he's still working within the same rule book as everyone else. It's not until later on that you start to realize the extent of that someone like Drew would go through to make sure that what he believed to be his, whether it be his children, his pension, his house, the extent that he would go to to make sure that they stayed his.
Anderson appears to have gotten everything he wanted. But old habits die hard, and Stacy begins to see a different side to the police sergeant she fell in love with. Stacy didn't have any friends. She wasn't allowed to go out. I mean, even if Stacy wanted to go to dinner, girls night out, you know. Drew was like, can I just go with? Can I just go with? And we're like, you know, no, it's girls night out. I remember sitting at the restaurant, just chit-chatting, nothing, and she seen Drew circling in the parking lot. Yeah, he cheated on every wife, you know, so I'm sure, you know, they always say the people who are the guiltiest are always the one who projected on everybody else. Drew Peterson was constantly accusing Stacy of cheating on him. It's a defense mechanism that's called projection. It's not me, it's you. The reality is, it's not really her. It's you, Drew. I met Stacy at the end of 2005. After a service, she came up to me. She just wanted to talk about seemingly regular marriage issues. Who should do what in the marriage? If it was normal for her to go to the grocery store without him being jealous? It seemed like there might be more to the story, but she wouldn't necessarily just come out initially and talk about that. Early in their marriage, Pastor Shorey counsels Stacy and Drew as the couple starts down a familiar path of jealousy and fights. I met with Drew and Stacy at their house. Stacy, just in tons of tears, told me that when she got home, Drew came to the door and accused her of having affairs. And she said, what are you talking about? I was seeing my sister. I'll never forget this, she said. He held me against the wall, and he stripped all my clothes off, and he smelled me to see if I'd been with another man. I looked over at Drew, and he had absolutely zero response. He glanced at me, stood up, and he said, Thanks for coming. I think I've had about enough today. I'd never felt afraid of Drew before that moment. People who have a pathological personality, when the story is not written in the way they want it, they completely lose it. They become vengeful. You are on their radar. You will pay. I knew she was in big trouble, and I didn't have any idea of what to do. I walked out the front door and I remember turning back and I looked and Stacy was just standing there just silently. I don't think she thought she was going to be around much longer. State police are asking for more help in the search for Stacy Peterson, the 23-year-old mother of two, has been missing now for nearly a month. Stacy Peterson is reported missing at the end of October 2007. Not by her husband, Drew Peterson, but by her sister, Cassandra who is convinced something awful has happened to her. My main goal right now is to bring her home. We've got Stacy's family saying she's missing. We don't know where she is. And we've got her husband, Bolingbrook Police Officer Drew Peterson, saying she ran away. She left me. What would you say to Stacy, your fourth wife? Come home. <laughs> Tell people where you are. And that's all I can say. Stacy Peterson wasn't Drew Peterson's only wife. As a matter of fact, she was his fourth wife. As soon as Stacy went missing that same day, somebody mentioned, well, you know, his third wife died under unusual circumstances. So I asked for the file. His third wife is gone, and now his fourth wife is missing. You can't tell me that you don't think something's going on here. When I looked at the autopsy report, it rocked me out of my chair. This is not an accident. I felt there was definitely cause to do the second autopsy. A deeper dive into Drew Peterson's past reveals some shocking information. Drew would reel these women in with the promises and with the honeymoon stage. When that honeymoon stage was over, and now it's time to go on to someone else. We're getting a developing picture of someone who wants the world to kneel before them. On the one hand, there's the police officer, the apparent good father. But on the other hand, there's a deeper, darker side to Drew Peterson. It's impossible to ignore 
that this master manipulator may have covered up some murderous tracks. It's a game at this point, and the walls are slowly closing in, but Drew Peterson's sticking to his story. Stacy Peterson left. One week before Stacy and Drew's fourth anniversary, Stacy Peterson is talking about divorce. We were talking all about her whole situation with Drew and how she wanted out and she wanted to take all four of the children. Something was really wrong. I told her that it was time to get out, although I didn't know how she could get out. I didn't feel like there was anything I could do. I knew my hands were tied. It haunts me. I, yeah. I wish I could have done something. Stacy had asked me how I felt about her getting a divorce. I told her I was scared because of what happened to Kathleen. And she just looked at me with this pale, blank face and said she was scared. And if anything ever had happened to her, I was to come and find her. If anything were to happen to her, Drew did something to her. I just looked at her and said, let's get the f*** out of here. Let's go. Pack everything up. Let's go. She said she couldn't do it because Drew would find her. Anyone married to Drew Peterson who says, you know what? I'm out of here. You can't ask to go unless they send you. We both got up and went out the garage and it was just this little aisle of clutter. But there was this blue barrel sitting there. And I go, what the hell is that? And she goes, oh, Drew got it. It's for the pool. Chlorine for the pool. And I just went on my way. This is Friday, two days before she went missing. Just a few days into the investigation of Stacy's disappearance, the state police get an unexpected call from an unlikely source. I identified myself as Kathleen Savio's divorce attorney and someone who had spoken to the woman that they were looking for maybe a day before Stacy went missing. Smith gives police a startling piece of information. A day and a half or so before she disappeared. I was a little surprised when my secretary told me that Stacy Peterson was on the line to talk to me about a divorce. She called to ask questions about, I'm going to leave Drew, and can I take the kids out of the state? Very normal questions people would ask. But then in that same breath said, do you think we could get more money in the divorce if we tell the police how he killed Kathleen? I say, maybe you shouldn't even be calling my office. And then she's gone 24 hours later. And so I called the state police. Police said they would get back to me, and then I called the state's attorney. And the next day, somebody came to my office, I believe, to interview me. Stacy made some statements to Harry Smith about the fact that she had some stuff on Drew. What she eventually told him was that he killed Kathleen. He said he could hear Drew yelling at her on that phone conversation. Police were now paying very close attention to Harry Smith's information. The people that I was meeting with, everything was falling into place as they were talking to me. I noticed a lot of nods and shaking of the heads. Including the collection of documents from his former client, Kathleen Savio, before she died. When they see what's in my divorce file, they have a client writing this letter saying he's going to kill me. We got all the statements. He said that uh, he could kill me and make, make it look like an accident. And that was another critical piece of evidence. It had been years, and this poor woman had tried to warn all of us. Somebody should have seen more in this the first time. So how did police miss what seemed so obvious to everyone else around them? So frustrating for the family of Kathleen Savio. There were documented instances of allegations of abuse, breaking and entering, of, of stalking. Those things were there. I don't think Ray McGurry had any idea of any of this when he took the job. I don't think he had any idea of any of this until Stacy disappeared. Nothing in his record, did, to my knowledge, indicates any type of domestic violence, excessive use of force. Um, none of that exists. 
I became the police chief uh, for the village of Bullenberg in August of 2005. Mike Calcagno was the, the chief and he was retiring. I should have known that Kathleen Savio and Drew Peterson had domestics. Didn't know it. Did a simple changing of the guard allow Drew Peterson to get away with murder? Ray McCurry became only book police chief long after Kathleen Savio's death had been classified an accident. That's my frustration sitting here today. That's why I've shut my mouth for 10 years and said nothing because, in retrospect, I probably should have known that. It's my fault for not digging deeper. After years of turning a blind eye, the Bolingbrook Police Department will not lead the investigation. It was probably mid to late week, uh, that first week that Stacy was missing, that the state police took over. It was their investigation, and I get that. You don't want the department to investigate their own because it casts some doubt as to whether or not they're going to be fair and open-minded about the investigation. It was like, thanks, Chief, we'll get back to you if we need you. As the investigation proceeds, police receive incredible information that will flip the missing person case on its head. From none other than Drew Peterson's own stepbrother. Tom Morphy is Drew Peterson's stepbrother. Tom told the police the last day Stacy was seen. Drew called him up and had him help him carry a blue barrel down from their bedroom. And loaded it into Drew's SUV. He said he never looked inside the barrel, didn't know what was inside the barrel. Drew Peterson and then drives to drop Tom Murphy off. Drew is gone for two hours before he's back home. The state police asked me, hey, did you see a blue barrel anywhere? And, you know, you were over here a week before or two weeks before. Did you see? No, I didn't see any blue barrels anywhere. Police begin an exhaustive search for the blue barrel. Tom Murphy says he has no idea where Stacy is. In addition to never even looking at the barrel after he loaded it up into Drew's SUV, that he has no idea where Drew took it. With this horrifying new revelation, the case to find Stacy Peterson quickly evolves into a homicide hunt. There were extensive searches. We searched the canals. Uh, that was a real labor-intensive effort. They would search on the water to see if they could find a little blue barrel that everyone was looking for. The search intensifies, but the state's attorney is working a different angle to make Drew Peterson answer for his crimes. So we needed to get the second autopsy to examine Kathleen's body. This was absolutely critical. Obviously, if we couldn't prove it was a murder, we're not even in the ballgame. Within 10 days, we did an exhumation. The process to unearth Kathleen Savio's body began with a backhoe breaking through the earth at Queen of Heaven Cemetery. The renewed focus on Kathleen's death is a moment the Savio family has been waiting for. I knew that he, he, he was involved with it. I, I just knew it. When Stacy went missing, I knew she wasn't going to come home. But when I heard that they were going to open up my sister's case, I was happy, surprised, and angered. Why does it take a woman to go missing for you to open up my sister's case when you didn't listen the first time? My initial reaction was, they're just digging at straws to get them on something. Never in a million years thought that's what was going to get them. Medical examiner Dr. Michael Baden is called in to perform a new autopsy on the exhumed body of Kathleen Savio. Journalist Steph Watts makes an arrangement with the Savio family to document the autopsy as it happens. Dr. Baden would be able to report whatever he found once he performed the autopsy, good news or bad news, to the family. I was allowed to be in the room and film Dr. Baden and write a report about everything I saw. How would you describe the condition of the body? In not very good condition. When we zoomed her from like the top of her thighs down was completely deteriorated because water had gotten into the casket but did not destroy the areas we needed to examine. I remember thinking, Savio family, I wouldn't want them to see her like this because it didn't look human. That's to think about what could have happened here, what did happen here. <laughs> We just moved in and eventually made it our own. Stacy Peterson is still missing. So until Stacy's brought home and Drew is convicted, her family's not going to rest. The story's far from over. Stacy's birthday. It's 
Shirtland, 33 years old. Oh, I got a picture. There's me and Stacy. Yeah, I like that one too. I remember uh, this one. We went to, I think it was like Tasty Penny. The lady went back, so we started trying on all the costumes and taking our own pictures. And then we got yelled at. <laughs> for finding my sister. 